Um, I'm going to give you just a quick brief overview about where, you know, kind of what this program is about. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you all for coming on behalf of the Global Education Committee. Um, that is myself, uh, Professor Lisa Hollander, Professor Nicole Bach, um, Kenny in the back, who has honestly, can we give Kenny a round of applause? no accolades until there are 12 German students back safely in Germany. I think that we should get those accolades now because he's put forth an amazing effort to um, make sure that our students who are here from Darmstadt have uh, had an excellent experience. And so they, he deserves the vast majority of the credit for everything that's going on today. Um, briefly before we get started with the student presentations, I'm going to invite uh, Professor Chris Otto to come on up. He is going to be leading some of the, the reciprocal trip um, where some of our students are going to have the opportunity to return to, um, to Germany as part of this exchange. So he's going to talk just real briefly about that program. And then I'm going to give you a brief overview of what they've been doing here, and then we'll get started with the presentations. Thank you. How many Jefferson College students are here right now? Could you raise your hand up? Okay, good. So. We need to get their names and numbers and uh, identification information because uh, I have a really easy job, and that is to try to convince you to go to Germany. And um, I, you know, I, I got some terrible advice as a student. I had an opportunity to study abroad when I was a student, and my parents, um, who are you know dis German descendants, but I know how they don't like debt, and so the idea was do not do this because you will incur debt and this will be bad for you when you start off your life. So after I graduated, I took all the money that all my relatives gave me and I bought an airplane ticket and a Eurorail pass and I spent the summer before graduate school in Germany and in Austria, in Belgium, in the Netherlands and I didn't really have a set itinerary and that's perfect for me. I just got up each day and went to the train station and just kind of went wherever. You won't have that kind of experience or that kind of freedom, but um, we are putting together a German literature class that will coincide with our trip. And so I'm trying to select works that will um, readily avail themselves to to, to actual trips where we can go to see the places where these people lived and wrote, and we can see some of the um, geography and topography of the places that are being described in the novels. And so if that sounds even remotely interesting to you, you should come. And, and, and I would also just sort of dangle this out there. You really have not lived until, um, I was talking to Michael Booker earlier today, you have really not lived until you've walked into a German bakery and smelled <laughs> real bread. And then I will, the last thing I'll just leave you with too is that um, as good as the bread is, um, I cannot tell you how wonderful it is to sit like in a monastery somewhere or, and, and look over a beautiful river valley and enjoy a, a great German beer. And so, um, to me, that's, that would be all I would need to hear and I would sign up for the trip. And so, um, uh, please, think about it. Um, don't do what I did. Gum a part of this uh, group. You'll get credit for college. You have excellent uh, professors. And um, I think it will really honestly be an event that will, will have a, a strong impact um, in your life. And, and, and it'll be something that you will never forget. And um, so, so please, please consider it. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to uh, my colleagues here, and, and then we'll hear from our German uh, uh, guests. So thank you very much. Does anybody else see a problem with this? <laughs> so I think we should name Chris Otto's trip Beer, Bread, and Books. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so just quickly to understand kind of what, where the students have been this week. Um, they are here. Um, this is their, I think this is the end of their eighth or ninth day here. They will leave us again on, I think, believe Wednesday of next week. 
Um, and while they've been here, they've, set, they've stayed with host families. If you're a host family, could you please raise your hand? I know we have quite a few, so thank them. Thank you, thank you, thank you for opening your home to, the, to our students. They've spent the weekends with their host families. They have uh, toured local businesses. They've toured our campus. They've attended. Um, a lot of the programs that they're attending are vocationally focused or career focused. So they've been to our health simulators. They've shadowed professionals. Um, and they've toured local businesses. This is their capstone. Many of the students have already presented in other classes. Um, and then we have the pleasure of having, I think, four or five students presenting today. Um, I'm going to ask our first student to come up, Jonas Rietdorf. And uh, he's going to give that. And they are going to reintroduce themselves so that if I do butcher their names, it's not so bad. Sure. Thank you. I hope you all can hear me very well. Okay, hello everyone. I hope you're all having a great time so far. My name is Jonas. I'm 21 years old and I'm from um, Germany. After today's presentation, I will have answered a question for you how our school system works in our country. But before we get started, I'd like to um, introduce my country and my city where I come from. This works. I live in a small village near Frankfurt, Germany, called Bad Audenbach, and we have only about 800 residents. The village itself is part of Heppenheim, and in Heppenheim, Sebastian Fenn was born. He is a very famous Formula One driver. Some teams he raced for um, are Red Bull Racing and Ferrari, and I'm attending various classes at Jefferson College until Monday next week as part of the exchange program mentioned by um, Lisa. Lisa. Yeah, Lisa. I'm currently I'm doing an apprenticeship at the Darmstadt University of Technology as a public administration clerk. And we have about 25,000 students. And now I think we should get started. OK. First, I'll give you a brief overview over the various types of school we have in Germany. After, I will provide you with interesting details about every type. To mix things up a little bit, I dug through some government statistics and put together a few diagrams for you. And last but not least, I'll throw in a few paths German students see themselves confronted with while leaving school, meaning whether they go to uni or start an apprenticeship or something else. Pardon me. Okay, as you may know, Germany is, as a country is made of 16 states, a bit less than the United States. Um, apart from the federal government up in Berlin, there are also federal governments, or state governments actually, um, and each of them decides on their state's educational policy themselves. And as a result, going to school may differ from state to state. Those students can switch, uh, switch schools from states without any restrictions. Therefore, I decided to explain the school system of my country on the example of the state of Hesse, where, where I live in Germany. And according to German law, the school attendance is compulsory from age 6 to 18. But if you, let's say, graduate from a school at the age of 16, your um, school attendance ends at um, this age. And one thing each and every state has in common, that the school attendance I mentioned, which is compulsory, is totally free of charge until the age of um, 18 or when you leave school. And to ensure compliance with the law, I mentioned parents are actually obliged to make sure their parents visit school. And if they fail to do so, the German states, first, they try to find them and make them um, look after their kids better. And if they fail to do that, the parents can actually end up getting jailed. I mean, these cases are sort of um, rare in a way, but they do happen. For example, um, I think it was this year that um, in a part of Berlin called Neukölln, the um, city intended to jail some 200 parents because they couldn't pay the fines for their children failing to attend school. And yes, there you can see that these cases actually <coughs> do happen. And this was reported by the um, Huffington Post. 
So the first stop in Germany's education system is the kindergarten. I think you have that too in the States. But there are some um, minor differences. For example, the students are between three and six years old. And after the kindergarten, the students attend so-called Grundschule. It's comparable to um, your elementary school, with the difference that the Grundschule is from first to fourth grade instead of first to fifth grade in elementary school, I believe. And the um, average student age at the Grundschule is six to nine years. And towards the end of fourth grade, teachers recommend parents what their students should do after the um, Grundschule. They sort of um, assess their performance throughout the entire um, four years in Grundschule. And then the parents get to decide where the child goes afterwards. But if, let's say, they are the opinion that the um, teacher is wrong at all, they can simply ignore that uh, recommendation. Sorry. Yeah, in total there are three types of school. The uh, students then get to, to, uh, to choose from. First, there's the Hauptschule, Realschule, and the Gymnasium. And note here that the difficulty of the three types of school that students get to choose from varies. It um, gradually increases. So from home to uh, it's very easy. Then gymnasium is the hardest, so to speak. And the first option, which is home to let students graduate after ninth grade. The second option is Realschule. And in order to receive the Realschule certificate, students have to study for one more year. And last but not least, there is, of course, the gymnasium, where students get to study for a total of 13 years, depending on the type of gymnasium they visit in Germany. And if a, student's, um, if a student previously attended Realschule, he can visit gymnasium as well. He would, just, he would then just visit gymnasium from 11th to 13th grade. That's why I wrote down gymnasium two times, to make it um, clearer to you. And the last three years of gymnasium are actually mandatory if you plan to go to university at any time in your life. And uh, mostly the students' performance is assessed with grade one to six, one being exceptionally good and six being, well, exceptionally bad. <laughs> <laughs> and only the gymnasium assesses students differently. Grades are ranging from zero points, very bad, to 15 points, very good. Okay, in this next part of the presentation, I'll explain the different school categories more thoroughly. <coughs> First up, there's the kindergarten. Kindergarten is attended by roughly 2.3 million children in Germany. The male-female ratio of teachers in kindergarten in this field of work is very unequal, to be honest. There are only 5% of, only 5 of teachers are male in German kindergartens. In general, people would expect this ratio to be the way it is, but I found it to be interesting to you anyways. <laughs> Another aspect I want to shed light on is the financial side of kindergartening. That's a term. Uh, the child costs annual cost of $9,000 on average. I actually converted the uh, figures to dollars. And uh, these costs are higher than for those for students in elementary school and later in Hauptschule, Realschule and Gymnasium. And to close off the kindergarten chapter, I'd like to mention an issue publicly debated in Germany on a regular basis. And that is that Germany, in general, lacks kindergarten personnel. And two of the main reasons for this are the fact that um, kindergarten teachers, when they are doing their apprenticeship, it takes four years, one year longer than traditional um, apprenticeships, they usually take three years. And the um, kindergarten teachers receive their first full pay after the apprenticeship. And usually you would receive full pay during your apprenticeship. So that's why um, many people don't want to do the profession of a kindergarten teacher, which is actually a problem because we have not enough spots for children. OK, in this next part of our presentation, I'll explain the different uh, the, um, grundschule to you. And the picture you can see on the, um, on the wall is actually very common in Germany. These bags you can see there are filled with um, necessary things for all the students. For example, a pencil, a ruler, or also sweets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
Okay, the very first option students get to choose from. I think. Oh, I made the wrong one. One second. Oh yeah, um, um, nearly every student in Germany visits the uh, Grundschule, and as most schools in Germany are public schools, you will see um, religion as a subject there as well, in one way or another. And um, the main things that are taught there are the very basics of reading, writing, and mathematics. And yeah, as mentioned previously, parents are recommended a path for their children's future after the um, fourth grade where they then can decide what um, type of school to join, basically. Coming up is the, are the three types of school I mentioned previously, the Hauptschule, Realschule, and Gymnasium. Okay. Oh yeah, there we go. And the very first option students get to choose from is the Hauptschule. And compared to the other two types of school, the Hauptschule is um, less challenging regarding its difficulty level. And students graduate at the age of, age of 14 after ninth grade. The percentage of students repeating grades in Hauptschule is 4.5%, and these are mostly boys that um, <laughs> repeat school. And it's actually the highest rates among the other three types of school, other two types of school. And with the Hauptschule certificate, which is the lowest certificate in Germany, Germany you can get, um, students usually start an apprenticeship or try to acquire the uh, Realschule certificate, which would mean that they have to attend school for one for one more year. And over the past couple of years, it has become harder and harder for students with the Hauptschule certificate to find any job at all because the requirements have increased in basically any area of work. Okay, next up is the Realschule, and the Realschule's difficulty level is higher than the um, of the Hauptschule, so you could say it's intermediate in a way. And additionally, students have to attend school for more than one year, as mentioned previously, compared to Hauptschule. And when leaving school, students are usually 15 years old, as long as they didn't repeat uh, any grades. And 8% of these um, students switch to gymnasium to acquire the highest certificate, the Abitur. And I fit into that very category because after graduating from Real Realschule, I joined the gymnasium for three years. And I'm actually kind of surprised by 8% of students joining the gymnasium because all of my friends joined, most of my friends joined the gymnasium after um, Realschule. Okay, and last but not least, we have to talk about the um, gymnasium. And with this last slide, I want to, um, I think I got mixed up again. One second, there we go. Okay, last we have to take, of course, a look at the gymnasium. And the differences between the other types of school are already, uh, well, in general, the differences are quite significant because um, the gymnasium has a much higher difficulty level than Hauptschule and Realschule. And also it takes three years longer than the Realschule and four years longer than the Hauptschule. And around, um, what I mean? Yeah, students graduate at the uh, 13th grade, but in Germany there are sort of two systems of gymnasium called G8 and G9, which let students graduate from I either at 12th grade or 13th grade. I think the um, 12th, 12th grade gymnasium was introduced a while back, but more and more states of um, Germany are sort of coming back to the um, 13th grade gymnasium because students are more and more um, stressed, they have more pressure on themselves. So yeah, many states are going back to that very system. And just to um, close off the chapter of the three different school types we have in Germany, students have to 
actually get the abitur, meaning finish uh, gymnasium to visit university later. And now to reset your attention, I've prepared some interesting diagrams for you. Uh, <laughs> this pie chart you can see on the wall um, actually shows us the school attendance in Germany after the Grundschule, meaning it shows that where the students go, either Hauptschule, Realschule or the Gymnasium. And remember, remember that students get to choose from a total of these three different categories of the Grundschule. Um, the first one is Hauptschule in dark blue, the Realschule in brighter blue, and Gymnasium in light blue. The grey coloured section shows us other schools which are less common among students or are basically a sort of mix of the of three types we have in Germany. Okay. Focusing on the three types we've got to know so far, we can observe that most students join the gymnasium after the fourth grade. Then followed by that we have the um, Realschule with 23% um, and the minority of students actually join the Hauptschule with only 12%. Okay, next up. I figured it would be interesting for you, as you are mostly American, to see how many students in Germany um, take English classes. And as you can see, nearly 90% of students in Germany take classes in English throughout their um, school attendance. I think mostly it starts in elementary school, and I think Germany is very, very good in this um, matter because Countries like China, they um, start taking English lessons at the age of 14 or 15, I think. And I mean, in today's world, English is becoming more and more important in the business world. Okay, yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. The other, the other um, languages we have are French and Latin in Germany. And French is a language that is also popular in Germany because Germany is adjacent to um, French. And I actually took French classes from 6th to 10th grade in the Realschule, although I can uh, barely speak any French now, apart from Je m'appelle Jonas, <laughs> that's basically it. And with Latin, which is only 8% uh, of students taking it, I think the main, the main reason why Latin is not very common among students is because Latin is mainly taught in the gymnasium, which is the um, hardest uh, type of these three schools I mentioned. And yeah, but Latin itself, I think you can use it in, when you go to university very well. So I think it's a good thing that mostly the gymnasium offers it because you have to go to the gymnasium anyways when you want to visit university later. Okay, now to um, some facts and figures about the school system to close this chapter finally off. Um, the costs for students in Germany are about $1,000 lower than those for kindergarten students, which is quite impressive. But also, I always thought that um, students would be more expensive for the state of Germany than the kindergarten teachers. And remember here that uh, um, the German state actually pays for these students. So we are not dependent on, um, on funds, I think, like uh, universities here or colleges in the States. And 72% of teachers are female, which is a bit lower than in kindergarten, where we had 95% of kindergarten teachers being female. And yeah, girls are actually more likely to go to gymnasium, and boys are more likely to um, go to Hauptschule, but the differences are minor. I think sometimes it only differs by 2%, so yeah, but I thought it just would be interesting for you to see that. <laughs> and um, some 40% of students join the, um, the Grundschule, uh, the Gymnasium after finishing the Grundschule, which kind of um, confirms the trend that I could observe in Germany over the past couple of years that more and more students visit Gymnasium just to fit into that, um, that pressure that students have because I think most students should really um, go to Realschule first and then decide afterwards whether they want to start an apprenticeship or go to university and in this and with this um, decision made, um, join the gymnasium. Sorry. Okay, and this is my um, last slide for today. And it's about the different uh, path that students take after 
leaving school for good, meaning either after graduating Hauptschule, Realschule or Gymnasium. In Germany, it's becoming more and more popular to do a so-called gap year. I think you all know what that is. And this involves, for example, volunteering in countries like South Africa or Ghana, maybe working at school. This is what my um, sister did for half a year. And then still the most common um, path are going to university or studying an apprenticeship. And what I did when I left the gymnasium, I actually worked in a program well, it was state-funded, called the Federal Voluntary Service, and there I worked at the um, at a cultural facility in Ludwigshafen, and Ludwigshafen is home of the, it's a big chemical company, I think maybe you know it, it's called um, BASF. It produces uh, many chemical ingredients, but also, I think, tables and stuff. They have many different products. And these are my references. Can see them here. <laughs> and all of my information came from either experience, as I, of course, went to school myself, or government sources, and the Huffington Post. Yes. Thank you so much. It's awesome. Yeah. I don't know why I said that so loudly. <laughs> Okay, the Abitur actually is a, a separate test from all the exams you take throughout um, the gymnasium. And it's the same for every state in Germany. And it, it involves um, topics, the most, in topic, the most important topics, of course, um, English, German, and mathematics. But some, uh, some schools, they offer a way that you can choose what subject you take. And there is the Abitur which is similar to an exam, it's just longer and it's more intense because it involves all the, the topics from all these three years of school. And there's also um, one or several oral exams which you have to take in, for example, English. And they should take about 15 minutes or 30 minutes depending on the, on the school or the teacher. Any more questions? Yeah? Mm. Oh yeah, sure, I'll re um, explain the apprenticeship system real briefly, I think. One of my fellow students had this topic in a presentation today. So basically, the apprenticeship system means that students get to um, visit a school for 50% of their time, roughly, and then an employer or, well, a business for 50% of the time. Myself, I work at the um, Darmstadt University of Technology, and Mondays and Fridays I have school which means they teach me the theoretical um, knowledge I need for that profession. And from Tuesday up until Thursday, I work at the Darmstadt University of Technology in the administration. I get to work in the accounting, in the, all the financial areas we have, also in the different department, uh, fields of study, for example, information technology. And that's, I think, a very good thing to have such an apprenticeship, uh, apprenticeship system where you have theoretical work to do and practical work to do at the same time, so you can really improve. Lovely. Other questions? <laughs> Another round of applause, please. <laughs> Lovely, thank you. So, yeah, I, I, and also realize that all of our students today are speaking in English. I know that that's not a shock to you, but they realize that they've been studying English uh, for a long time, but that this is their second language, and I think they're doing an amazing job. Yeah. Our next speaker is Benjamin Davis. Can 
hear me everyone? Okay. Thank you, Jonas. Nice presentation. Um, how does this work? Do I have to just have to press here? Yeah. There you go. Okay. Right. Hello, everyone. Hello. Um, as you already know, I'm here to experience the American way of uh, going to a college and. Yeah, well, today I'm giving you a presentation about the German textile economy. First, I have to say this is going to be a very simple way of showing you the textile economy because you could actually study years for understanding all the details. So it's just a simple way. First of all, to get a little bit more uh, confident and more comfortable, I would like to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Benjamin Davis. I'm 20 years old. I live in a small town called Dreisch Offenthal, which is close to Frankfurt. Uh, currently, I'm doing an apprenticeship at a car dealership named Hedge. Autos Hedge represents Volvo, Jaguar, and Land Rover. So, what I'm basically doing is a three year learning in a theoretical and a practical way. In school, I learn how a car dealership theoretically works by studying the details and the functions of every section that work together to resolve the dealership. At Auto Asset, I learn in a practical way, which means during the time of the apprenticeship, I'm going to work for every section to get the actual know-how. The goal of the apprenticeship would be when graduating the apprenticeship, I have the ability to either work for a car dealership in any section I would like to, or start up my own dealership. I also have the ability to study at a university to do a further education. But after all, let's forget the cars. <laughs> I'm not here to talk about cars anymore. I'm, my intention for the apprenticeship is not to be working for a car dealership sometime. It's actually getting educated in business. As I realized the car industry is very complex, as well as leading a car dealership, I got interested in a product which is produced and sold way easier than cars. So I'm talking about clothes, textiles. So today I would like to show you a simple image of the economic structure of textiles, which with related advantages and disadvantages. I would also uh, like to talk about the, how the profit is actually made. And at the end, I will show you some German designers that you maybe have already heard of. So this is a very simple picture of the economic structure. At the beginning, on the left side, you can see, um, first of all, the cotton is picked, uh, cleaned and stored at a company where the cotton is weaved to huge textile rolls. You could just follow from left to the right and everything else that you, you, you'll probably understand. So it's first picked, cleaned and stored at, the, um, at a company where the cotton is weaved to huge textile rolls. In that section, all the different kinds of textiles are made, something like jeans or this or chino uh, pants or something like that. Uh, later, the rolls get painted in all different kinds of colors. The colored rolls are now cut into pieces and sewed to clothes. And then they are ready to be shipped to the company and that sells the textiles to the end customer. And that would be right here. So the system relates financial advantages, but also moral disadvantages. I'm going to make an example by using the cooperation of the German and Asian economy. Um, the German currency is higher than the Asian currency, which means that allows German companies to investigate bigger in productions in Asia than they could in Germany, which is a final advantage for German companies, obviously. The payment in Asia has a very low standard compared to those in Germany, making those people work being aware of the bad payment and low standards is a moral disadvantage. In Germany, we have a high consumption of clothing, which means the textile companies are gaining high profit. So basically, high German co clothing consumption means big German investigations, mean lots of badly paid Asian work, mean comparatively cheap, huge amounts of tech textiles, mean high profit for German companies. Unfortunately, there's not much we can do about the low payment 
other than not buy the products. But in the end of the day, every customer buys the brand and the clothes that they like without knowing or caring who actually made that particular product. It's just how it is. But the currency difference is, and the low payment isn't actually the main reason for the high profit margin. It's marketing. And marketing is, oh, wait a second. Marketing is actually my favorite part of uh, economic, no, ec economy and business. Because the name and image of brands with certain prizes separate clothes into categories of status symbols. So, it is how we customers see ourselves in clothes to represent our personal style and interpret our status symbols, which everyone does. Uh, that makes us and our point of view on clothes to the most important thing about marketing. Our opinion on status makes the profit margin. As, uh, in this picture, you can, we can see the left kid is wearing normal clothes with no special brand. And well, I would say the whole outfit would maybe cost 150 euros with the shoes, with the pants, the jacket, and the t-shirt. And on the right side, we have a kid suit up in Gucci clothes <laughs> with the Gucci bag and the Gucci shoes, Gucci jacket, which could cost about 1,000 euros, everything. So that's only about the name and about the marketing and what the uh, brand is telling us. So... And that is not even a bad thing. It allows companies of all price categories to emit and images to grow, and it keeps the economy of textiles stable. Now I would like to show you a German brand that was made up by a man who created a lot, who cared a lot about moral disadvantages. His name is Wolfgang Grupp, and he founded the company named Trigema. That's yeah, that's the logo. Uh, the cotton, the cotton of his produ uh, products is grown, picked, weaved, cut, and sewed in Germany with a fair payment for every worker. And that's the image of his brand: good quality by fair payments. And now at the end, the last. Oh, this is. Uh, I would like to show you this. At the right side, we see Tommy Hilfiger. Maybe everyone knows Tommy Hilfiger. I think so. And on the left side, we see uh, Trigema. So if we compare those clothes, they cost, well, the Tom Hilfiger shirt would cost $90, and the Tugema shirt would cost $60. They're actually the same. They definitely have the same uh, quality. They just have a, a different name, and that's why they gain different prof uh, profit, just to see how much marketing actually does. Now, I'm going to show you some German designers. Maybe you've heard, heard of them. First one would be Michalski. If you're aware of uh, the German show, uh, Germany's Next Top Model, that's one of the judges. And he makes, yeah, simple clothes, I would say. These are just some pictures. They don't, they don't even cost that much. The short, no, the pants would cost about $80. The um, top clothes, like the t-shirt, would cost $60 for something like that. Every, of course, every product costs different, but they're not too expensive. They're just normal, regular, good clothes. Then we have Karl Lagerfeld. Karl Lagerfeld was more into suits and stuff, which is really expensive. One whole suit could cost about 500 euros or dollars without the shoes. The shoes always cost extra. <laughs> and the last one would be Philip Klein. Philip Klein is a designer who has made uh, clothes for very wealthy people. His clothes are very expensive. So those are some examples. On the top left side, we have a uh, jacket which is made out of uh, real crocodile leather. So the jacket would cost $80,000. It, it does, yeah. The others are not made, of, made out of animals. It's just regular clothes, but they also cost about 5000 to 10000 each. And the shoes would also be the left one, I think it's 4000 The one in the middle is 3500 I don't know how much that costs. But it's about the same. So that's what Philip Line stands for. And again, we can see the name of the brand and the image and the marketing. And our view on the price tag makes the profit margin. 
Are there any questions I can answer? Yes. Uh, is, is there a national minimum wage in Germany that you have to pay every worker at a minimum? In Germany, yes. We have, uh, it's 850 every hour you have to pay the every worker. It doesn't matter what, uh, what job it is, but you have to pay 850. But not us. Well, we're apprenticeship students, we are learning, so our payment would be like below four dollars, which is a shame, I would say. <laughs> yeah, but we're learning, that's why we don't get paid. Right? Any other questions? Yes. Um, well, the health in... Well, there's, a, there's, a, there's, there's no requirement as far as what you receive, benefits you receive if you are part-time versus full-time, is that right? There no, there's no, there's no difference, actually. You have all the same health the care. The health insurance is socialized, I know. Yeah. yeah. But um, aren't there the same equal benefits, other benefits even, for part-time versus full-time employees? What? I don't know. Well, uh, there are no, there are no different benefits actually. You can, well, what it's about health care or health insurance. You can um, have private, like a private. Like public, like public health. Oh yeah, you answer the question. My topic is healthcare, um, healthcare system in Germany. So the government has a So there, there are differences. There is a difference. You can either do that private, you can either pay more and be better. Uh, what's that covered. Covered. covered, yes, covered, thank you. You'd be better covered if you pay more. That's would be the private part. Or you just uh, have the regular thing that everyone has and you're still covered pretty good. Better than here, I, would, I think so. I'm not sure. I don't know the. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Okay. Are there any other questions I can I can answer in the economic? All right. No. All right. Okay. Thank you for your. Thank you. No. <laughs> Our next presenter is Anya Kirsten. I'm 19 years old. <laughs> I'm living in Frankfurt, but I used to live in Neuss, that's between Cologne and the Netherlands. And I'm doing an apprenticeship as an industrial management assistant in a company called Telekom. It's the biggest provider of telecommunication in Germany. Maybe you know the sub company T Mobile, that sounds familiar. So they provide telecommunication in the US. However, away from telecommunication, I am going to present you German traditions. Okay. Let me come to my agenda. So I'm starting with Carnival and Easter. Then I will continue with the great May Day, Marksman's Fair and Oktoberfest. I think you've all heard about the Oktoberfest in Germany. <laughs> <laughs> then I will continue with Advent and Christmas time, with Christmas and with New Year's Eve. So Carnival is beginning on a Thursday called Weiberfastnacht. It's six days long and there are carnival processions where people are dressed up in costumes and they throw sweets at the people. They can collect them and eat them. There's a lot of alcohol in this fest and there are regional differences. So Carnival is mostly in 
areas in the Rhineland, like Cologne and Düsseldorf, but only in, also in Mainz. Here you can see a carnival procession. You can see that people wear costumes. So why do we celebrate carnival? Because the fasting period begins um, before Easter, and it starts on Wednesday after carnival, so people want to celebrate and eat something <laughs> that they can't eat in the next 40 days. Let me continue with Easter. A few days before Easter, people are painting eggs with the whole family. They are blowing out eggs, painting them and hanging them on, hanging them on trees. Um, the end of the fasting period is on Easter after 40 days. But on Good Friday, we also don't eat meat. On Sunday, our eggs and sweets hidden in the garden and people tell their children that uh, they are hidden by the Easter bunny. I think that sounds familiar to you. <laughs> and on Monday, we do a walk with the whole family. We also have Easter fires. You can see one here. They are a tradition because they recall Jesus' resurrection and are a sign for the light and the darkness. And they are on the Saturday. So let me continue with the Great May Day. In German, it means Tanzen in Mai, which would be translated dance into the May. It starts in the night of the 13th of April to the 1st of May, and most of the people go dancing on that evening. Um, but also in some, can, uh, in some regions, people go hiking. Um, there's a May tree, so some men decorate a tree and bring it in front of the girlfriend's house to please her, and she's really happy. <laughs> <laughs> but on leave years, it's the other way around, so the girlfriend decorates the tree and brings it to the boyfriend's house. And in some regions, people crown May kings and May queens. So let me come to a very regional tradition. It's the Marksman's Fair. It's in the city I live. So it's very traditional and it's on the last weekend of August. So people are in riflemen's clubs the whole year. I think you wonder what do you do in a riflemen's club. Uh, you see each other once a month, talk and go on vacation and it has a huge social aspect. But we are in Germany so you also drink very much beer in these clubs. <laughs> On the Marksman's Fair, um, there are many marching parades. You can see them on the upper image. And in the image above, you, uh, no, under, under the image, you can see that there are many flowers. So the highlight is the King's Parade on Sunday. You can see it on the image below. In uh, 2018, there were 7,705 riflemen. And it's a lot of fun. So I think you did not really understand what you do on Marksman's Fair. So at first there are men and they shoot at the wooden bird and the person that gets to shoot the word is the king for a year. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, he has to give everyone a beer, that's really expensive. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the people participate as riflemen, go to the marching parades and at the same time there's a huge fair. It's the greatest tradition in the Rhineland and it's very peaceful and fun. So let me come to the fair. There are many food shops and fairground rides. The riflemen also participate and it's from Friday to Tuesday, open from 1 p.m. to midnight. Also lots of beer and partying. <laughs> Germans love beer. <laughs> so I think you all have heard about the Oktoberfest. It's in Munich on Theresis Green and it's locally called Wiesen. Is the world's largest fox fest since 1810. It has also a huge fair and over 6 million visitors. It has 1 billion euro turnover and is 30, 16 to 18 days. Uh, it begins in the last two weeks of September. In 2017, it was from the 16th of September to the 3rd October, and in 2018, it is right now, so you could buy a plane ticket and travel there. <laughs> At the first day, the major role broke a cast and shouts of zapft auf eine friedliche Wiesen, which means in English, let's have a good, peaceful Oktoberfest. <laughs> Following to these sentences, 12 gun salute, and uh, yeah, some breweries even brew a special beer for the Oktoberfest, because there's a large consumer of beer. In 2013, it was 7.7 .7 million liters. People also wear garb, they wear lederhosen and dünnel. These look like this. 
And 72% um, of the visitors are Bavarian, but also many people come from America to visit the Oktoberfest. Then we celebrate Advent. Um, you have an Advent calendar in Germany. You open it every day and you get a little present or chocolate or something. And we also have Advent wreath. You can see it on the picture. We light a candle every Sunday before Christmas. We also have St. Nicholas Day. Um, children have to clean their shoes and the Nicholas brings sweets and presents. The Nicholas Day is on the 6th of December. And we also eat lots of cookies and we drink lots of warm wine. On Christmas, we have, like you do, a Christmas tree. We decorate it on the 23rd of December. On Christmas, we celebrate it on the 24th of December, not as you do on the 25th. We go to church and we have a huge meal on the evening. Um, some people eat potato salad, others eat duck. And we also get our presents on the 24th of December. On the 25th and the 26th, we spend time with our family. Let me come to New Year's Eve. Uh, the most popular meal is raclette. If you wonder what a raclette is, it looks like this. Um, you put stuff in there and bake it, mostly with cheese. It's very delicious. And people also do fireworks, spend time with their friends and family, go dancing or to a restaurant, and have, we have midnight sweets when the new year is there. So thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, let me know. And <laughs>
So after World War II, Germany was divided in four occupation zones, which you can see on this picture. The green one is England, the red one is East Germany and the Soviet occupation power. The yellow-orange one is America and the blue one is France. The Western occupation zones have been further and further politically removed. In 1949, the German Democratic Republic and the Federal Republic of Germany were founded. And after that, Germany was divided between East and West. The situation was aggraved by the Cold War, which was between 1947 to 1989 and the border was secured more and more, and the Berlin Wall was built on the 13th of August in 1961 in Berlin. So now we come to the Federal Republic of Germany and the German Democratic Republic. On this picture you can see the Federal Republic of Germany and its west. And the first chancellor was Konrad Adenauer. They had the social market economy. There were free elections. They had freedom of expression, freedom of traveling, and more supplies. Now, imagine living in a country which is divided into zones. You're living on the side where you can buy everything like CDs, food in a big selection, clothing and all the stuff. So now the German Democratic Republic, it's East. Um, the German, re it was the, sorry, um, the GDR was the Soviet occupying power. It existed between 1949 and to 1990. There was no freedom of expression. The SED was the only party. It was the Socialist Unity Party of Germany. And everything was controlled by the Stasi. The Stasi is the Ministry for State Security. And it was, it was the official state security service of the German Democratic Republic. And it was one of the most effective and repressive intelligence and secret police agencies to have ever existed. The motto of the Stasi was shield and sword of the party. The main tasks of the Stasi were spying on the popu spying of the population through a network of citizens turned informants. They tortured citizens because they might be from the Federal Republic of Germany or have contact to the Federal Republic of Germany and most of them were innocent, but they didn't care at all. They just wanted to believe what they wanted. Now, the two Germanys. First, the Federal Republic of Germany. They had press freedom, the supply was very good. As I already told you, they had like everything that GDR hasn't. And now the German Democratic Republic. Um, the citizens were intercepted by the Stasi and they had no press freedom and citizens have been spying on each other to get better conditions and they told everything the Stasi to not get suspected. And you were not allowed to study if you had contact to your family in the Federal Republic of Germany. So now I'll tell you something about the border. The border was 862 miles and it separated the German Democratic Republic from the Federal Republic of Germany. The English, French, Soviet and American occupation powers were separated by the war. And there were many escape attempts to the west, which I tell you um, later about it. Um, there were about 327 deaths. In 1960, the German Democratic Republic built border fortification. 
It, consist, it was consisted of barbed wire fences, minefields, bunkers, and observation posts. The border was secured more and more, and it was from the South Bavaria, Saxony, um, Federal Republic of Germany, Czech Czechoslovakia to the Baltic Sea. And on this picture, you can see the border fortification system. Yeah. Um, now I'll tell you something about the Berlin Wall. The Berlin Wall was a border fortification system of the German Democratic Republic. And it covered all four sectors. It separated east from west. Um, there was no traveling anywhere. Um, the wall existed between the 13th of August 1961 to the 3rd of October 1989. And the wall was 99 miles. And um, Walter Ulbricht, chairman of the Council of State, said no one intends to build a wall, but two months later the wall was up. Mm. And yeah, roads, the railway and suburban railway lines were interrupted and subway stations and cemeteries were closed. Yeah, and on this picture you can see the wall from inside. I know the picture is very old, but it was the only good picture I could find, so yeah. On this picture you can see on the left side the Berlin Wall and on the right side you can see the Brandenburger Tor and no Berlin Wall anymore. So it's a picture from today, from nowadays. <laughs> um, now coming to the escape attempts. Um, there were escape attempts in the hood of the car, which I can show you on the picture. Yeah, people were hiding in there to come to the other side of the wall to see their families or have a better life. And um, they will self-dig tunnels, which you can see on this picture. There's a woman um, crawling through a self-dig tunnel and it's very small and um, they build air balloons. And I can show you this on a video. Here yeah, in this video you can see a family who successfully um, escaped the Berlin Wall. So, and they did it at night so nobody could see them. So that was the video. Um, now I'll tell you something about the German reunification. On the, on the 9th of uh, November 1989, the speaker of the German Democratic Repu Republic regime, Günther Schabowski, accidentally announced that everybody is allowed to travel in the Federal Republic of Germany. But the, the Hungary dis mantled and fully opened its borders with Austria on the 11th of September 1989. 
there were protests and demonstrations. To avoid a breakdown of the German Democratic Republic, they decided to open the borders and this led to the breakdown of the wall. Helmut Kohl wanted to reunite Germany and France and England were against it. There was no reunification without the consent of the victorious powers of World War II. In 1990, the foreign ministers of the four allies consult with their colleagues of the German states on external conditions. They Sorry. Um, they talked about the rights and the allies or and alliance membership. And Helmut Kohl and Mikhail Gorbachev traveled to Caucasus. And the next day, the Soviet president announced Germany as reunited. Thousands of thousands of people met at the Reichstag in Berlin to celebrate the reunification, which I can show you on this picture. And you can see happy people, they had fireworks and German flags and yeah, it was a pretty awesome day for them because, yeah. So thank you for your attention. I hope you liked it. Any questions? Yeah, there's a question. Oh, no. oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, can we give all of our students another round of applause?